Various laws. Our first number is 0.55 pounds. All drones basically have to be registered with the FAA unless they're under this weight. The maximum weight, 55 pounds. 13, here's a question. Under what condition would a small UA not have to be registered before it is operated in the United States? And the answer is A, when the aircraft weighs less than 0.55 pounds on takeoff, including everything. You can take the test when you're 16 years of age or older, and the test, if you pass it, it will remain valid for two years. Another good number to know is 400 feet above ground level. Here's a test question. To avoid a possible collision with a manned airplane, you estimate that your small UA climbed to an altitude greater than 600 feet above ground level. In this scenario, a plane was coming at you or something, and you decided it was wise to fly up to 600 feet, breaking the law. Uh, to whom must you report the deviation? Um, the answer here is C, upon request of the FAA. It's important to know, it's okay to fly over 400 feet if there's an emergency. If there is a building that is 10 stories high, maybe it's 100 feet and you need to fly above it, maybe for aerial photography, you could fly up to 500 feet. Now we get into the 500s. A couple of the numbers you need to remember are 500s. You need to be 500 feet below the clouds. So if you look at your weather report and you find out that the cloud ceiling is at 600 feet, that means you'll only be able to fly up to 200 feet. Horizontally, you have to stay away from clouds too. You'd have to stay 2,000 feet away from it, horizontally. You'd also have to stay 2,000 feet away from guy wires. 100 miles an hour, that is the maximum legal speed. Three, SM visibility. SM is statute miles. Eight is the number of hours that you have to go between having a drink and flying your drone. 0 0.04, that's the legal blood alcohol level. Maybe eight hours ago, you got super tanked, and then eight hours later, you still have a 0 0.05 blood alcohol level. Uh, I mean, first my hat's off to you, but you still can't legally fly that drone. You gotta wait for your BAL to come down a little bit. And if you get convicted of some sort of narcotic, you have to wait one year after that final conviction. Not when you get arrested, but your final conviction. You can fly your drone before sunrise or after sunset for a period of 30 minutes. Here's a question about that. According to laws, what is required to operate a small UA within 30 minutes uh, after official sunset? A, the use of anti-collision lights. $500. That is the limit that the FAA draws before you have to file an official report about an accident. And that is not counting the cost of your drone itself. Another number you should remember is 10, 10 days to file that FAA report. You have to file it within 10 days of the accident. Um, the only other time you have to file an FAA report is if somebody is seriously injured, not scraped. Those are most of the big numbers you have to memorize. What I would suggest doing is getting my study guide. It has all those numbers written down and then Right before you go into the test, review those numbers. And then when you sit down at your desk, pull out the pencil and piece of paper that they give you and write down the numbers. Uh, let's talk about different airspace rules. This gets weird. Here's a diagram from the FAA. At the top, Class A airspace, everything from 18,000 feet up, airports will start to claim different sections of airspace below that point. The, the lower the letter, the the bigger it is really. So class B airspace is for major airports. Class C airspace is for smaller airports, like regional airports. And it typically has these two tiers. And then class D airspace is for kind of really small airports. And this is what you really need to know for the test. If you're in any of those airspaces, except for class G airspace, which is just general airspace or class E airspace, you can fly in those. But if you're in class B, C, or D airspace, you could fly your drone if you had permission from air traffic control. Let's talk about radio stuff. The CTAF, it's used for pilots to self-announce. Multicom is what you do when there's no CTA of frequency. It's basically these kind of reserved frequencies. Let's talk about radio talk. <laughs> Alpha Bravo, Charlie Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, Golf, Hotel. India, Juliet, Kilo, Lima, Mike, November, Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango, Uniform, Victor, Whiskey, X-Ray. And the last two, Yankee and Zulu. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about physics. Stalls are bad. The key thing you need to know about stalling is it happens when the plane exceeds the critical angle of attack. If there's something impacting the plane that would make the situation worse, like mm, maybe you're, you're banking heavily or something, it's going to increase your stall speed. It sounds like increasing your stall speed is a good thing, but that means that instead of, you stall when you're going too slow. So instead of having your stall speed at 100 miles an hour, if you increase your stall speed, it means you'll actually stall at 150 miles an hour. So increasing your stall speed makes things more dangerous. Here's a question related to that. A stall occurs when the smooth airflow over the unmanned airplane's wing is disrupted and the lift degenerates rapidly. This is caused when the wing exceeds its critical angle of attack. The load factor is basically how much pressure is on an airplane. Now, if it's in a heavy bank, of course, that's that's adding some G's to it, right? You're putting more pressure on it. Um, and they want you to understand that. If you get a question about it, they'll, they'll show this chart to you. And then they'll also show you an index that says, say, um, a bank angle of 60 degrees will give you a load factor of two. Let's look at a sample question about this. When operating an unmanned airplane, the remote pilot should consider that the load factor on the wings may be increased any time the center of gravity is shifted rearward to the aft CG limit, the airplane is subjected to maneuvers other than straight and level flight, or the gross weight is reduced. In this case, the load factor is increased by any sort of maneuvers. Another question, if an unmanned airplane weighs 33 pounds, what approximate weight would the airplane structure be required to support during a 30 degree banked turn while maintaining altitude. A lot of information there. The key numbers are the airplane weighs 33 pounds and a 30 degree banked angle. So let's go back to our chart here. So you'll look at 30 degrees and you'll go up here and you'll see it's at like 1.1. You'll multiply 33 times 1.1 and that will get you to uh, about 38 pounds the center of gravity. Changing the center of gravity beyond the limits that the plane was designed for will negatively impact the handling and maneuverability. Here's a sample question. To ensure that the unmanned aircraft center of gravity, gravity limits are not exceeded, follow the aircraft loading instructions specified in, it's the pilot's operating handbook. Okay, sectional charts. Let's take a look at what airspace looks like on a chart. The Groton Airport is here. And if you're wondering about the airspace, look, there's a, a dashed blue line right through here. And maybe you've already forgotten whether a dashed blue line is B, C, or D. Go up to your legend here, and here you'll see a dashed blue line is Class D airspace. What frequency do you need if you want to contact the Groton Airport? It's going to be the 125.6, but if you were confused about that, again, you could just look at it. What does the number 25 in the box mean there? Look at the legend again, number in a box. That's the ceiling of the Class D airspace in hundreds of feet. So the number 25 in a box, that means the ceiling of the Class D airspace is 2,500 feet. This is the Boston area, Logan Airport. Here's a question. What is the floor of the Savannah Class C airspace at the shelf area, the outer circle? And in this particular question, you'll probably see 25 over 13. 25 would be the ceiling of the Class C airspace and 13 would be the floor. These uh, numbers are always above sea level, which is MSL. Let's look at another close-up of a red flag that indicates a VFR checkpoint. VFR stands for visual flight rules. What they want you to know about these red flags is planes might use them as beacons and therefore there might be more planes in this area. I just wanted to show in this particular example, you can see 41 over SFC. This means the ceiling of the airspace is 4,100 feet. The SFC stands for surface. Let's take a look at another close up here. Here, well, we do have a tower here. Here's something else and it's altitude. This is above sea level. And then 233 is the altitude above ground level. Here's another interesting marking. See the little parachute dude there? There might be skydiving in the area. More icons here. Here, this particular airport has skydiving and it also has gliders. There's the visual flight rules. 
So at another airport, which frequency should be used for CTAF communications? Come back to your legend. See, the legend says follows the common traffic advisory frequency CTAF and indicates this little C. So you can just look at the airport data and see the C. That means that it's this number here. And the star here indicates that it operates only part time. It's all in the legend. You might have been tempted to look at this number. That's the ATIS, the Automatic Terminal Information Service, which might have information on, on rental cars or whatever. So when in doubt, go back to that legend and just make sure that you're looking at the right number. Uh, let's move on. Okay, you'll see these blue paths here indicating frequent flight paths. Let's talk about prohibited areas. This is the one from the FAA samples, but it's actually indicating Camp David. Restricted areas, here's a sample restricted area. There's numbers here that start with the R and then have a code. If you look at your sectional charts over in the like the bottom or the margin of the sectional chart, there'll be uh, some notes about when exactly it's restricted. Usually there's some sort of hours. And I think the test will even ask you uh, like to look up a phone number there. They will have frequencies where you can listen to get some information about whether it might be in use or not. Specifically, the FAA wants you to know this language about restricted areas. Restricted areas denote the existence of unusual, often invisible, hazards to aircraft, such as artillery firing, aerial gunnery, or guided missiles. Let's talk about the MOA is the military operation areas. These are places where the military, Air Force, Navy, anybody with planes might be flying exercises. And it doesn't mean you can't fly in an MOA. Military training route, MTR, IR, or BFR. Here's an example of what they look like on a map. You can see this particular one shows IR. 037. And that's just an example. You might also see it indicated as VR, not VFR, but VR. Here's a sample question related to it. The chart shows a gray line with VR 1667, VR 1617, etc. Could this area present a hazard to the operations of a small unmanned aircraft? In this particular case, the answer is B. Yes, these VR lines indicate military training routes that go from the surface to 1500 feet above ground level. Let's talk about the difference between latitude and longitude. 41 degrees. Do you think this is indicating latitude or longitude? The answer is latitude because this is indicating how far north it is of the equator. 40, 41 degrees north of the equator. If we were, we were to scroll up a little bit, what do you think would be up there? Would it be 40 or 42? The answer is it would be 42 because zero latitude is um, on the equator and then the numbers go up from there. We're, all the examples are going to be in the northern hemisphere in all likelihood. 70 degrees indicating the longitude east and west, 70 degrees west of like Greenwich. So as we go west, as we go to the left, those numbers will increase. You can think about it this way. As the United States was settled by the Europeans in the east, and then we worked our way west. Each one of these tick marks is one minute. This is 70 degrees and this is 70 degrees in one minute, 70 degrees in two minutes, 70 degrees in three minutes. Um, there's big tick marks every five minutes and then bigger tick marks every 10 minutes. So if they ask you to find 70 degrees in 10 minutes, you'll start at 70. Remember, higher numbers go west, 70 degrees in 10 minutes, 70 degrees in 15 minutes. What if they ask you to find 40 degrees and 58 minutes latitude? Um, that's going to be here, right? Because here's 41 degrees. So we just need to subtract one, two. So take away from this numbers get higher. The further you go north, north and south is latitude. East and west is longitude. The numbers get higher as you go west. Every tick mark is one minute and you will be counting tick marks for some of the questions. Here's one sample question. Which airport is located at 47, whatever. And you'll have to be able to go to the map and find that specific airport. Another question, what is the line of latitude at area four measure? You should know when you look at the sectional maps, they refer to areas just for the sake of the question. And so there'll be like a number four in a circle or a number three in a circle. You can answer this question because what do you think a line of latitude would measure? Does it measure east and west or north and south? You climb the ladder. So right away, we know it's gonna be B. So let's talk about runway patterns. Um, planes, take off and land into the wind. Airplanes, when they're landing and taking off, generally circle to the left. Helicopter traffic tends to go off to the right. Runway markings, the pilot comes on and he's like, we're 
We're landing in a uh, runway niner. What he's saying is he's landing in runway nine, but that number indicates the compass direction of the runway. So runway nine is oriented 90 degrees. Zero degrees is north, 90 degrees is directly east, 180 is directly south, and then 270 is directly west. But they drop one zero. So runway 27, which direction do you think runway 27 is facing? It's west, right? Runway 18 is facing south. Whatever airport you're at, that's how it works. Runway 13 is at uh, the, the plane coming in for a landing would be at 130 degrees, which is like southeast. Let that sink in a little bit. Understand that upwind is heading in that same heading direction, whereas going downwind means you're going opposite the runway direction. You have to be able to kind of draw 130 degree runway and figure out what direction you're heading when you're downwind and left of the runway, that kind of thing. And here's a sample question. While monitoring some runway CTF, you hear an aircraft announce that they're midfield left downwind to runway 13. You can see why you might want to draw this out, right? Where would the aircraft be relative to the runway? Think of it one step at a time. Runway 13, 130 degrees, right? On a compass, what direction would that be? Southeast. So if the plane were heading upwind, they'd be heading 130 degrees. They're heading downwind. So they're heading 360 minus, they're 360 degrees on a compass, 360 minus 130 degrees, which puts them at 230 degrees. So they're, they're going, instead of going Southeast, they're going Northwest. So now we know the plane is going Northwest. Okay. So let's just map this out. So the runway, the runway is 13, so it's headed 130 degrees. We know people are landing going from up here to down here, which means the wind itself is going in this direction. So the question itself says midfield left downwind. We know the plane is midfield left downwind. So it's midfield. So it's in this area somewhere and to the left of the runway, it's going to be relative to facing upwind. So you're facing this way, which means your left is over here and your right is over here. So now we know that the airplane is like right about here. And sorry about my drawing. And the question asks, where would the aircraft be relative to the runway? The aircraft is east. Let's talk about the different documents that the FAA wants you to know about. They're gonna ask you questions like, which document should you refer to for this and that? The first is the user manual, the maintenance schedule. Again, the maintenance schedule is something the manufacturer is supposed to provide for you in the user manual, and they don't generally. Under what condition should the operator of a small drone establish a scheduled maintenance protocol? You have to establish it yourself when the manufacturer does not provide a maintenance schedule. Sectional charts are the answers to lots of questions about what you should refer to uh, for information about like class D airspace, detailed information about MOAs, military operation areas, protected areas, different airports is in chart supplements. And this is what a chart supplement looks like. Sample question. The most comprehensive information on a given airport is provided by, it's not the sectional chart, it's the chart supplement. Notice to airmen, note them. This has time critical stuff in it. When Donald Trump was elected president, that day, the FAA issued a notum to not allow people to fly like over the Hudson River, basically around Trump Tower. Notums are going to be the answers to lots of questions about timely stuff, emergency stuff. Here's a question. How would a remote pilot in command check notums as noted in the caution box regarding an unmarked balloon? If you need to check a notum, where you need to go is to 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM. Meteorological Aviation reports have weather information, as do the terminal aerodrome forecast TAFs. If there's questions about weather, that's where you should be looking. This is what a METAR report looks like. Oh my God. First up, the type of report. The second block, three letter code for the airport plus a K. The code is GGG, uh, John F. Kennedy Airport. Their METAR would say KJFK. This one, that Z at the end, we call it Zulu. That indicates UTC time, like Greenwich Mean Time, like universal time, not local time to the airport, but UTC time. So this is a time code. 
The first two digits of that time code indicate the day of the month. And then the next four numbers here, 1753, that indicates the time of day. Remember, you just have to subtract 12 if you're used to using the AM PM system. So the 16th day of the month at 5.53 p.m. UTC. The next word, auto, means that the report was automatically generated by some sort of weather station. It could also say COR, which would mean corrected. This mess of numbers and letters is the wind speed. The first three digits indicate the compass heading. It's 140 degrees, southeast winds. The next two digits, 21, indicate the knots of the wind speed. So 21 knots. And then you see G26, 21 knots gusting to 26 knots. And they actually write KT here. Here's an example. The wind direction and velocity at KJFK is from, and then you'll look at that report and you'll have to be able to figure it out. Another example, you can see here, it says VRB, that means variable winds, which means they might be going north, they might be going south, it's kind of changing around, and usually variable winds are also low wind speed winds, so it's saying at five knots. If you see the SM there, that's indicating statue miles. That is indicating your visibility. So you can see at three quarters of a mile. Another example of a fraction, this means one and a half statute miles of visibility. You're supposed to get three statute miles of visibility before you fly your drone. So this would indicate that you shouldn't be flying your drone. We have an indication of what the weather is actually like. TSRA indicates thunderstorms and rain showers. The BR actually indicates the mist. Looking at this, TS, thunderstorms. RA, rain, BR, mist. If you go back, you'll notice the very first thing is a plus there. That plus indicates the intensity or proximity. So a plus TS means heavy thunderstorms with rain and some mist. This next section indicates the cloud cover. They're indicating altitude by dropping two zeros off of it. So this BKN means broken clouds. And then we're going to add two zeros to this number, 800, zero, zero, broken clouds at 800 feet. This means overclassed clouds at 1200 feet. The CB means cumulonimbus clouds. So they're indicating the type of cloud. And then the last digits here, this chart shows you what those different codes mean. BKN broken, OVC is overcast. You might see scattered or few clouds, um, or you might see them saying clear skies, etc. This last section here indicates the temperature and dew point in Celsius. It's indicating the temperature is 18 degrees Celsius and the dew point is 17 degrees. If those are within three degrees. That indicates like a higher chance of like water forming on your plane. Whew. <laughs> um, there might be more information in there. Like RMK is indicating remarks probably won't be tested on it. So here's a question about the METARs. They'll show you a METAR and ask you what the current conditions are for that particular airport. Look at the airport code and have to look at the METAR and figure out which of multiple METARs applies to that particular airport. You'll just be looking for, in this case, KMDW. And then you'll have to be able to discern all of that. Um, remember, they add two zeros. So like two of these, like this one is clearly distracting you, trying to confuse you by thinking that the number seven indicates 7,000 feet when you know they add two zeros, so it means 700 feet. And then beyond that, you just need to figure out whether it says one and a half or two SM, and you can figure out which of those two answers is correct. The TAF reports, terminal aerodrome forecasts are formatted very similar to METAR, but they both suck to look at. It's like, unless you're a computer. The report starts with TAF. The next is the airport code. These reports start with a K and then the three digit airport code. What does this mean? It's got a Z at the end, right? Zulu, UTC time. They use this weird format. So the 11th day of the month and then 1130, it's under 12. So that means 1130 AM. That's when the report was generated. And then the next phrasing indicates how long the TAF is valid for. The 11th day of the month to the 12th day of the month. Noon on the 11th to noon on the 12th. Tempo means what follows next is going to be kind of temporary, kind of transient. And then you'll see the period of time that the following conditions are valid for. Visibility is 5 SM. Remember what BR meant from earlier? Mist. FM is from 3 o'clock. Now we're moving on to like a different time. This code has knots, which means wind speed. First three digits indicate the heading, just like METAR. So 160 degrees southeast at 15 knots gusting to 25. 
And during this time period, remember SM means statute miles. It's a measurement of distance. That's your visibility. So six statute miles, they just put a P if it's six or more. This is a description of the clouds. SCT means scattered clouds at, remember we add two zeros. So four zero 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 four thousand feet. Broken clouds at 25,000 feet. FM, that means from. So again, we're indicating a different period of time. The first two digits indicate the day of the month. This is the next day, 12 o'clock at midnight. Four zeros means midnight. KT indicates that it's wind speed, right? 140 degrees at 12 knots. Our visibility, six statute miles. The P in there means that everything is good. Again, now we go into a description of cloud cover. You know, this is the weather from this time to this time. And then for the next block of time, this is what the weather's going to be like. So starting at midnight, we're going to see broken clouds at 8,000 feet, overcast clouds at 15,000 feet. There's a 30% probability on the 12th day of the month from midnight to 4 a.m. Visibility dropping to three statute miles, 30% probability of that. Thunderstorms and rain, broken clouds at 3,000 feet, cumulonimbus clouds, from the 12th day of the month, from 4 a.m. all the way until midnight. We have wind at 140 degrees at eight knots, visibility six statute miles, scattered clouds at 4,000 feet, overcast clouds at 8,000 feet, temporarily on the 12th day of the month from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., low visibility at three statute miles, thunderstorms and rain showers, and then overcast at 3,000 feet, cumulonimbus clouds. Whew! not that hard. Let's talk a little bit about weather. They want you to understand the effects that changing weather conditions can have on the performance of your craft. High altitudes have a low density of air. Low at altitudes have a high density of air. They'll use the terms low density altitude to mean the density at low altitudes. And the term high density altitude means the density at high altitudes. Here's a question about that. What effect does high density altitude have on the efficiency of a drone propeller? Drone efficiency is decreased. You know how the weather guy will say like, oh, there's a cold front coming in. There's a warm front coming in. What that actually means is there's a bunch of cold air hitting a bunch of warm air. And that division is considered a front for weather fronts divide weather patterns. Wind shears are sudden drastic changes in wind speed, structural icing, ice forming on the wings or the plane. Let's talk about the life cycle of a thunderstorm starts with a cumulus cloud. It moves into the maturing stage and then ends in the dissipating stage. Humidity, humidity makes air hazier, but it also makes the air a little bit heavier, which can actually make the efficiency of your drone uh, a little bit better. Unstable air tends to be hot and humid. Turbulence is caused in air that is unstable and showery. Here's a question about that. What are characteristics of a moist, unstable air mass? Would you expect it to be smooth? No, you would expect turbulence because I just told you unstable means turbulence. Stable air will often have the heavy air. It'll have a lot of humidity in it. The visibility can be poor and it can also result in a steady rain rather than like rain coming down in sheets and varying a lot. It can just be like a nice drizzle. Here's a question about that. What are the characteristics of stable air? We might see it probably wouldn't be good visibility because the humid air is going to be nice and stable. So it's going to be poor visibility and steady precipitation. Stratus are those high wispy clouds. I just want you to know those terms. One of the team members you'll see referred to as a visual observer. You are the remote pilot in command. The PIC, remote PIC, is the answer to a lot of questions. They're going to ask you who's responsible for this and that. Let's look at some sample questions. When using a small drone in a commercial operation, who's responsible for briefing the participants about the emergency procedures? The remote PIC. Whose responsibility is to inspect your drone to ensure it's safe? The remote PIC. Who's responsible for determining the performance of the drone? The remote PIC. I just want you to know the term crew resource management because let's talk about risk hyperventilation. And that's not something that dumb. Alcohol is bad when you're flying a drone. Other times it's generally great. Fatigue is also one of those things that's bad, like alcohol. And they want you to know that. Your remote pilot for a co-op energy service provider. You're going to use your drone to inspect some power lines. Um, but as you drive out there, you become fatigued and well, is that good or bad? Fatigue is bad, right? So fatigue can be recognized, um, easily by an experienced pilot. No, again, it's going to be, the, if it's something dangerous, the answer is going to be the worst case scenario as fatigue can be recognized as an, as being in an impaired state. So talk about how to scan the sky for threats. You look directly at a space in the sky 
look at the different areas, stare at them, make sure that everything is clear. Look for movement. Here's one sample test question. Identify the hazardous attitude or characteristic a remote pilot displays while taking risks in order to impress others. Macho. Macho people take risks to impress others. You've been hired as a remote pilot by a local TV news station to film breaking news with your drone. You expressed a safety concern and the station manager has instructed you to fly first. Ask questions later. What type of hazardous attitude does this re represent? And that's impulsivity because he's doing away with planning. He's being impulsive. Crew resource management must be integrated into all phases of the flight. Here's a question about it. Safety is an important element for a remote pilot to consider prior to operating an unmanned aircraft system. To prevent the final link in the accident chain, a remote pilot must consider which methodology. It's probably crew resource management. When adapting crew resource management concepts to the operation of a small drone, CRM must be integrated into. That wraps up my cram. Now I'm going to give you a few tips for taking the test. Um, I like to do things in, in two phases. I study. I bring as much information as I can into my long-term memory. But as I'm studying, I'll, I'll get a sense for what stuff I am not retaining properly. And I will write that down in a little personal study guide for myself, all the stuff I can't remember. And for that, I cram. And I, I will arrive at the testing facility usually about 30 minutes before I need to walk through the door. And in those 30 minutes, I will just be looking at those little facts and trying to get them in my head, at least into my short-term memory. Then when I get into the testing center, I will write down those facts on a piece of paper. The computer system will give you the option to mark it, answer it, give your best answer, but mark it. If you fail, um, the FAA drags you out of there, beats you and never lets you fly a drone again. If you fail, no big deal. You two weeks later, you can take the test again. You can see now it's just a pattern.